G'day, nice to be back in Geelong after uh, two weeks in Adelaide. Um, the title of today's talk um, is Here Am I, Send Me. So it follows on a bit from uh, Dale's testimony. Here Am I, Send Me. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 6. And first one. In the year that King Uzziah, Uzziah died, I also I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. This is the prophet Isaiah speaking, high and lifted up, and his train or his skirts filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims, each had six wings, with twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. So an amazing occurrence here. And then Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Or as it says in the column, I'm cut off. Because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for mine eyes hath seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So it's a bit of an analogy like under us before we came to the Lord that we were cut off from God. We were um, aliens from the commonwealth of God. We were um, having no hope without God in this world. And it goes on to say, Then it flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this have touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And again, a forerunner of us when we receive the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist talked about the Holy Ghost and fire. And that the, uh, the Pentecostal fire happened to us when the, uh, the coal of fire of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost, when it touched our lips, we spoke forth, in a new tongue. We received the Holy Spirit. And then what happened? Our iniquity is taken away and our sin is purged. And after repentance and baptism, then we're fit for the Master's use. And also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. So at the top of the talk, so now we're fit for the Master's use. Uh, the prophet Isaiah and the Old Testament prophets, they were spokesmen for the Lord. They would often say, thus saith the Lord, and then they would tell people what the Lord saith of him. And even today, we are now the spokesmen of the Lord. We go out to the people. God is sending us to the people to tell the people, thus saith the Lord, the Lord says to repent, to be baptised, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we'll go on to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35. Jesus speaking, uh, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel and the kingdom of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So of course, Jesus was the ultimate, here am I, send me. And I guess when you think about it, when God had the plan to uh, save fallen mankind, that you know, who would he send down to this earth to be born a man and then to die on the cross and his uh, blood shed for our sins? Well, Jesus had to, to agree with that. So he is the ultimate, here am I, send me, as he went out, in this case, preaching the gospel and healing the sickness. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep 
having no shepherd. So a little, a little side point here is Jesus and the Lord, he doesn't like it when sheep have no shepherd. They like sheep to have a, a good shepherd, to be shepherded. And uh, uh, it does say, woe unto the, the shepherds that scatter the sheep. The Lord doesn't like a shepherd not to be a shepherd, but to look after the sheep. Uh, just a little side point. So we're fortunate we, in our fellowship, uh, shepherded according to the Bible. But he goes on to say, then saith he and his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the labourers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth labourers into his harvest. So as we go along in our life, we can, we can labour, we can have our own endeavours, our own labour, we can labour in our own harvest. And I can sort of think back to my walk in the Lord early on, where I was doing a lot of my own harvest, my own labourings, I was setting up this business and doing this and doing that. But it says here that it's the, the Lord of the harvest. God has a harvest. It's his harvest. It's, it's his endeavour. It's his plan of salvation. It's not our own things that we want to do in our own particular lives. We're to go into his harvest and labour and um, work in his harvest, not our own endeavours. Let's go on to, it is the ultimate harvest, it's the harvest of the souls of mankind. John chapter 4. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Again, he's the ultimate, here am I, send me, I want to finish the work. I'm not going to be distracted by my own labours, my own endeavours. I mean, he could have. He could have done anything he wanted. But he, his sole purpose was to finish the work that God had sent him. And he went on to say in verse 35, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then come of harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. So a couple of points here. If you could say, here am I, Lord, send me, but send me in four months' time, and I'm, I'm busy doing this, I'm, I'm busy doing that, I've got to fix this up, or I've got, we've got lots of kids or we've got this or that or work or whatever but it's not in four months time it's to labour in the harvest now they're white ready to harvest and we might think in our day you know we're talking around to people and no one wants to listen to us you know there's dull of hearing we might think oh you know, no one wants to hear about the Lord but Jesus here said look at the fields they're white here in Geelong the field of Geelong it's white, it's ready to harvest there's people that are praying Lord show me the truth they're disillusioned with the man made religion, the man made churches, the, what's happening in their lives they're, they're worried about what's Russia doing and, and China and this and that and they want to know the truth the fields here in Geelong they're white, they're ready to harvest, we've just got to go out there and labour in it. And verse 36 And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice. So now we've got sowing and reaping. And Jesus said, I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labour. Other men laboured and ye were entered into their labours. So the Old Testament, we talk about the Old Testament heroes um, in Hebrews 11, the Book of Faith. So the Old Testament people went out and they, they sowed. Um, they were ones that sort of laid the foundation of belief in God and obedience, you know, talk about or hear about Abraham who believed God and had faith in God it was 
imputed unto him for righteousness. And you know, he taught mankind to believe in their faith in God. And Moses taught mankind to obey the commandments. They were, it was like they were sowing. And we've entered into their labours. But we get the good part. We're the reapers. Now, I'm not a farmer, but Lyle lives over there. And reaping is much better fun than sowing. <coughs> Will that be right? Joan's nodding her head because sowing, you've got to do all the work. And, and then it's a long, long time. But when you're reaping, you, you're seeing the benefits. You know, you're reaping the harvest. You can gather in the harvest. You take it off the market. You get paid for it. You can then pay your bills and you can take your wife out for a nice restaurant meals. Reaping is good. So we've, in the, old, in the New Testament, we're now reaping. The Old Testament, they, the sowing, but we get the good part where we can say to people, you know, it's good to have belief in God, it's good to have faith in God, it's good to keep God's commandments. But in the New Testament, if you want to believe God, keep His commandments, His commandments are repentance, baptism, and being filled with the Holy Spirit. We get to see someone and pray for someone, as we did uh, just recently with Tali, just before uh, Christmas. See her filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. Now that's reaping of what's been sown. And we get the good part. We can go into the harvest and reap. Let's go on to Hebrews. Chapter 12, which goes on from chapter 11, where it talks about these great men of faith who sowed, laid the foundation. It says in uh, chapter 12, verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. All these people that have sowed, but now we get to be the reapers of the harvest. And it says just in the verse before it that they without us, these Old Testament heroes, they without us should not be made perfect. There's no good sowing if no one reaps. And what some farmers do is they, they might sow their crop, but they haven't got the machinery to reap it, so they might contract that out to some reapers and get someone else to do the reaping. But they will be hoping that they will do a good job. They've done all the hard work sowing. They want to see this reaper do a good job reaping for the harvest. And so it is with us, these Old Testament people, in a sense, not literally, but in a sense, they're around us as a cloud of witnessing, witnesses, seeing how we reap, how we can tell people about the fulfillment of the new and the better way of uh, receiving the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. There are a cloud of witness as we go out and we reap. And it says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So I've watched a few running races and when people run, you don't often see them with a backpack of 30 kilos on their back. Um, Maybe our race might seem like a bit of a marathon. We've had uh, COVID the last couple of years, and it seemed like a bit of a, a long marathon. But um, often what you see in a marathon is when the runners enter into the stadium where all the crowd is, so they get a second wind. They get a second burst of energy. And we are really in the last of the, the last days. Maybe we've been spirit-filled for 60 years, 40 years, or, or maybe just the last two years has seemed like a marathon, but now we're in the last of the last days. We're entering in to that stadium, and the crowd is cheering us on. The angels are cheering us on. It's only a, a few more metres before the race is finished. And we don't get to stand on a podium. No, we're lifted up into heavenly places. That's not a bad finish for the race. 
and the crowd, the heavenly host is cheering us on. They're saying, only a little bit further now. Just a bit further. Now's the time to get your second win. Now's your time to get that burst of energy. We've got a couple of runners at the back. They know what it is. It's a scientific thing, the second wind of runners. Now's the time to get that energy. Now's the time. More than ever, here am I. Send me. It's just a little bit further now. We're in the last of the last days. Now's not the time to be worried about material things. Houses, cars, motorhomes. Jayco, RM20 slash 5. Motorhomes. Now's not the time. <laughs> Material things, they're going to pass away. And I'll tell the story about how I learned about the material things that don't really give you joy. They don't really give you joy, happiness. Because joy is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You know, a peace of mind, all these good things come from God. That, you know, when I was younger, you, know, you might think these material things would give you this, this um, joy, happiness, but they don't. I tell a story. I, I might have said it, told it before, but that's okay because now I'm elderly. You can tell the same story over and over again. <laughs> so this, the moral of the story is, I'll say it before the end, so you know, is that mature things don't really um, give you joy, happiness. In fact, the more expectation you have of this material thing that's going to give you happiness, the more it's going to come back and bite you. When we were young, a long, long time ago, in our 20s, we had, we had cars, and we didn't really worry if the car was new or old. In fact, we used to say, I don't really care what sort of car I have, as long as it gets from A to B. Because that was really the challenge in those days, for the car not to break down along the way. But then as you get a bit older, you save up some money, you got enough to buy the new car. And here it was, and I think it was about 31 or something. And I brought home the Mitsubishi Lancer. Brand new. Same my age. Coupe. Um, maroon metallic Juco. And I drove it home, brand new, and parked it in the driveway. And fellas, you know what happens next, don't you? You sort of you walk away and you just have to look like you've got <laughs> oh, there it is. It's so shiny. It's such a nice little shiny idol. So the of my story, the end of Act One, new car, everything's everything's wonderful. Begin Act Two. Enter the cat. Now we as young married couple, following the protocol that before children you should try out your sort of parenting skills on pets first before you have babies. So we had two cats, scriptural cats, Reuben and Levi. <laughs> and within a week of having this nice new car, one of the cats, it was fortunate I didn't find out which one, but one of them decided he wanted to snuggle down in a nice warm place. And so as I parked the car on the carport, carport walked away, I had a quick check just to see it was still shiny and nice. And that night it snuggled down on the boot on the bonnet, front bonnet of the car, it was nice and warm because the engine had kept it warm. And it sort of did this. <laughs> Even today, what happened next, I'd wake up in the morning to check this shiny idol, and there on the front bonnet was these round scratches. Even today in my brain, I can still see the scratches that are indelibly printed. I was traumatised. <laughs> this car that was to give me so much joy and happiness now was just a pang of, of grief, traumatised, and I had thoughts about what I would do to the cat. <laughs> and the Bible talks about that we should have thoughts, thoughts that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely and good report, but I wasn't thinking these thoughts. So already this thing in my life was not really enhancing my walk in the Lord. And in fact, it pained me so much because I had so much expectation it was going to give me a blessing, this, this thing, that to alleviate the pain, I went to the most expensive crash repairist in Adelaide 
European pressure pools and spend about, I think about 2,000, which would be like 10,000 these days, dollars to get the whole bonnet resprayed. Because they had to take away the pain. I just couldn't see those scriptures. So, moral of the story is material things, they don't do it for you. It'd be nice to have, sure. But the Lord's coming back. We want to do the Lord's work. Now, fast forward some 20, 30 years, and we've been waiting um, 11 months for a motorhome to get built. But I had prayer this time. I said, Lord, I don't want to be, I want to put this in this right spot. It's a material thing. It's not going to give me blessings like you do. It's going to get wrecked. It's going to get stone chips. It's going to get scratches on it. And I just had to pray to prepare myself. And yes, it's not even a month old and already bad things have happened. <laughs> Came back from camp and I washed it. Three stone chips. One on the left, two on that side. Not that I was counting, but... <laughs> I noticed the two, it was like one big one, then at seven mils distance at a 37 degree angle was a one. I could see it was like a, a hit and a ricochet. Oh, that must have been when that guy overtook me and just cut straight in front of me and flicked stones at me, thank you very much. But I thought, no, don't worry, it could be worse, it could have been a hit, ricochet, ricochet. Ricochet, or a hit, ricochet, smash window. Or it couldn't have been a little rock at all, it could have been a semi-trailer, side swapping me. As happens to our brother pastor. So you don't worry about it, you just move on, it's going to happen. But other things happen too. Whilst we were at camp, I'll just try, uh, digress for a while. Whilst we were at camp, I wasn't even two weeks old and we enjoyed the night meeting, had fellowship after, and we were uh, in the motor home, and I was sitting down. Just, just a wonderful relaxed state just before we turned in uh, to sleep. Had a cup of coffee opposite me. It was my lovely Linda child bride of 40 years. I mean, what? Sitting in a nice, not quite too big old motor home. Could life get any better than this? Just thinking about the meetings. And, and I started to sort of drift off into a, a happy place. A lovely, snuggly, happy place, drifting off, thinking about the Lord and how great life was. What could go wrong? Um, Little did I know, the pickled finger of fate was about to strum a chord of tragedy. <laughs> As I was drifting off in a peaceful place, a loving, peaceful, a happy place. But the cup I was holding was on a journey too and was doing a tilt. <laughs> and my wife is very observant, noticed it, and she has options. She could have quietly and gently reached forward and just lovingly broke the cup and placed it on the table. But no, she didn't do that. I was in my nice, quiet, snugly, safe, happy place and he just, Brad! <laughs> and I went in 3.6 nanoseconds from a happy place to a state of panic and fight or flight and my, my arm did a knee jerk we actually went ah! <laughs> and the contents of the coffee went airborne flying through the air all over the walls, the ceiling back of the passenger seat the sofa, the floor and it wasn't just flat coffee, you know, this is a cup of tuna this is milk coffee and after checking that my heart was okay, it was alright and I saw the coffee, you know, Tripping off the walls, and I started to have thoughts. <laughs> but I've grown a lot, and I were, weren't thoughts about the cat. But I had a thought was like, was why? Why would someone do that? <laughs> so I was of age, and I verbalised, used my words and verbalised them, and ask my wife, why would you do that? <laughs> and. She had no response <laughs> because she was laughing too much. But the moral of the story is material things, they're nice, sure, we're nice, and we're still, you know, we 
look after them and wash them and a good testimony. There's no point having someone over to your house <coughs> if you haven't mown the lawn in 10 years and they can't find the front door. So we, we do things for testimony's sake, but they're not it. They're not going to give you that uh, blessings that the Holy Spirit does. There's a, there's a second law of thermodynamics. I remember Pastor Darrell gave him this talk years and years ago. The second law of thermodynamics, which is a physic, phys, physical law or law of physics, is that in a closed system, entropy increases or disorder increases. In other words, as time progresses, things will go from order to disorder or from a complex state to a simpler state. Things will get old. Things will break down. Things will rust. Things eventually turn to dust. That nice brand new car with enough time, the Jico will fade, the, the plastic will disintegrate or rust. It will be reduced to just a pile of rust. So we don't put our, our endeavours in such things. That's, um, and the whole universe is subject to this second law of thermodynamics. I mean, when I was in my 20s, I was a fine specimen of human beings. And now, 40 years later, it's the second law of thermodynamics has taken its toll. And really, the universe will eventually, the stars, given enough time, the stars will just burn out. And everything will just turn to dust. But of course, we'll be back before that. But let's um, go on to Matthew. Chapter 6. <coughs> Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt. And with these break through and steal. So here's uh, the Lord mentioning where <coughs> rust doth corrupt. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Where things are going to rust, things are going to break down. But lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Oh, sorry. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust. It could be a, a moth and a rust. But anyway, where moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through to steal. So in the kingdom of heaven, there is no second law of thermodynamics. There's no rust. There's no rust that's going to corrupt. Rust is going to break things down. Rust is going to reduce the complex to the simple. There's no second law of thermodynamics in heaven. No one grows old. Nothing breaks down. There's no wrinkles, ladies. Fellas, the lawnmower will never, will never break down. Nothing breaks down. You can be in your spiritual motorhome going from galaxy to galaxy when you come back from Andromeda there's no stone chips. In fact, you don't even have to wash it. There's no dust. There's no dirt. There's no vacuum cleaners. The kingdom of heaven is everlasting perfectness. Something that we're, we're just not used to. Everlasting perfectness. Where well, your treasure's there will never um, go to corruption. It will never break down. So we set our affection on those things, the treasures on heaven. And when we're doing the Lord's work, and the Lord says, who shall I send? Who will go for us? And you say, here am I, send me. That's laying up treasure in heaven. We will never be corrupted. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 6.
Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. But God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labour of love, which you have showed toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and to minister. God doesn't forget the work that we do. Here am I, send me. Well, God doesn't forget that. You know, God says, who's, who's going to come on Sunday and, and help set up? Here am I, send me. And you can minister to this brother or sister who's going through a hard time. Here am I, send me. We've got some brothers go down Friday night, just witnessing, giving their pamphlets. Well, who am I, send me? You know, the, the work of the Lord, there's lots that we can do. And now's the time. The same before now is the time that we've in our marathon race, we've entered the stadium, the angels are cheering us on. Here am I, send me. Now what can I do to labour in that uh, in the Lord's harvest? And when we do, God doesn't forget what we do. Let's go to first Corinthians chapter fifteen. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. Your labour is not in vain, but God doesn't forget what you do. God doesn't forget that here am I. Send me, Lord. Send me. And we'll leave it there. Amen. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.